Well, thank you for joining me today for episode number nine of the Healthy Skeptic MD podcast. I'm Dr. Michael Hockman. I wish you a good Halloween this year, even if we can't be out there trick-or-treating, although that's probably a good thing for our health. So according to last year's Gallup poll, pharmacists among professions ranked among the top with respect to honesty and integrity. And we certainly place considerable faith in pharmacists to make sure that no errors slip by with our prescription medications. But according to my guest today, Dr. Stephen Chen, who's the Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs at the USC School of Pharmacy, which is among the top pharmacy schools in the nation, there's probably some important innovative ways that we could better take advantage of these highly trained healthcare professionals. Steve is a good friend and colleague of mine and a national expert in this area, so please do stick around. It's an interesting discussion. If you do like what you hear today, please do search and subscribe to the Healthy Skeptic MD podcast wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. Please also subscribe to my YouTube channel, Healthy Skeptic MD. So before we jump into our interview with Dr. Chen, let's do a quick rundown of the health news for the week. And the first item I'm going to mention is a new recommendation from the United States Preventive Services Task Force. This is the agency that makes recommendations for preventive health care. They announced this week that they are considering, it's a preliminary recommendation, they are considering lowering the age when colon cancer screening would begin from age 50 to 45. So this would certainly affect a lot of people. Before they finalize this recommendation, I would recommend that they listen to episode number five of the Healthy Skeptic MD podcast with Dr. Gil Welch. In that episode, Dr. Welch argues that the benefits of cancer screening are not as great as many of us intuitively believe. Now, in making their recommendation to go from 50 to 45, the task force cites encouraging data about colon cancer screening in younger individuals. But I still find myself more compelled by the simple argument that Dr. Welch makes, that no rigorous study has shown that colon cancer screening actually causes us to live longer, which of course is the primary goal of cancer screening. Now with my patients, my recommendation is to consider starting colon cancer screening, not with an invasive colonoscopy, but instead with one of those stool tests that test if there's blood in the stool, uh, beginning around age 50. But if it doesn't make sense to you, it is perfectly reasonable to pass on the screening. So the next news item I'll mention is that at last week's vaccine advisory board meeting for the FDA, many experts urged the FDA to wait at least a few months to gather safety data before considering approval of a COVID-19 vaccine. Currently, the FDA has said that they want to see at least two months of safety data, but two months may not be quite long enough to fully assess safety risk. Now, my take on this is that there may be a middle ground here. There may be a way that after two months, if we clearly see the vaccine is effective, which we certainly don't know yet, but if it does appear to be clearly effective and safe, we can expedite it to high priority populations with an informal sort of authorization, but wait several months to collect the necessary safety data to give it the full stamp of approval. Okay, so the final health news item I'm going to mention is that remdesivir is in the news again. Uh, Last week, it received uh, FDA approval. Until now, remdesivir has been used under a less formal emergency use authorization. Now, the timing of this FDA approval is somewhat perplexing, given that just last week, the World Health Organization released the results of a large trial that found it was not effective. Now, I think the FDA's approval is a mistake here. I think the emergency use authorization, that informal approval, was the right balance. It allowed patients to have access to the medication, but without providing that formal approval. And now with that formal approval in place, there's going to be much less incentives to do rigorous research on the drug. So we definitely have to keep our eye on the Food and Drug Administration. It's not easy what they do, uh, but we do need to, to keep an eye on it. So with that, let's jump into our interview with Dr. Steve Chen. Well, very happy to have you. Steve is truly one of the nation's best known pharmacists. He's frequently found uh, testifying before legislators and in front of Congress and various august uh, panels. Um, So we're very lucky to have him here. He's also been on the front lines as a pharmacist working in homeless clinics uh, and another a number of other safety net settings, which we'll talk a little bit about today. But Steve, before we get to some of those details, let me just ask you this. Um, you're the former dean of the School of Pharmacy once said that pharmacists are some of the most highly trained yet underutilized healthcare professionals. That's something that certainly I found to be true, but, but what's your take on, on that? Yes, that's actually a very common uh, description of pharmacy today. In fact, uh, in the Hill, 
there's an article written by uh, one of the House of Representative members that had the exact same title, the most overtrained and underutilized healthcare professional. Uh, you know, why is that? I, I think a big part of the reason is um, the expectation or the perception of what most people have for a pharmacist is sort of stereotyped by um, your retail chain drugstore pharmacist. And certainly not saying anything negative about that. It's just the perception. Uh, I don't think uh, most uh, consumers, most lay people uh, think of pharmacists as being uh, frontline healthcare providers. Yet to your point, pharmacy education has changed dramatically over the last several decades. Uh, pharmacists now uh, can only get a doctor of pharmacy degree, whereas in the past, uh, you could get a bachelor's of, of, pharma, of science in pharmacy. Uh, what does that imply? That means that the training is at a different level of rigor when it comes to clinical uh, training. So we train side by side with all members of the healthcare team in all four years of pharmacy school. Uh, pharmacy students are in clinical settings, escalating their um, uh, ability to apply uh, their uh, knowledge into uh, clinical management of patients. Uh, pharmacists uh, can choose to do a residency, uh, one years, two years, and now we're starting to get into three years of residency postgraduate, postdoctor of pharmacy. I think that's important for something that we're going to come back to, the scope of practice, what, how we can best take advantage of what uh, pharmacists can do. They're, they really are some of the most trained healthcare uh, professionals out there. Let me just also ask you this, Steve, what kind of people does, does pharmacy draw, does the field draw? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I'd say similar to other health professions, uh, it's, it draws people that uh, want to help people, right? And your same similar DNA as a physician, a dentist, uh, you know, optometrist. I think the difference is if you sort of look at the range of people that you know, come to pharmacy, uh, many of them uh, maybe worked in a pharmacy, uh, maybe had a relative that owned a pharmacy. Uh, you know, the community pharmacy is so different today uh, because there's so much dominance of the chain drug stores, but there still are a significant number of these independents. And uh, you see some of the best care for patients uh, taking place in those those pharmacies because they have more time dedicated uh, to patients. So uh, many times you get uh, relatives of pharmacy owners who are coming into pharmacy because they're familiar with that background. And then in other cases, you get people who say, I, I love sciences. Um, I just don't see myself as a physician, but I'm really fascinated with medications. And their path becomes either you know, pharmacy practice or in the drug discovery area. So I've seen some surveys that sh say that the public trusts uh, pharmacists just as much as about any other health professional. I think nurses are always number one and then pharmacists come down yeah. Yeah. Number, number two. So yeah. it really does tr attract a, a, a very dedicated uh, group of people. And I, it's certainly consistent with my experience too. So be, because of what you do, I think pharmacists are often, uh, um, you know, s s considered to be pill pushers. But actually, in my experience, the, the opposite has been true, that they're frequently looking to identify what medications are unsafe and to get those off the patient's med list. Is, is that tr true? Is that accurate? That is absolutely accurate. And I'm glad you said that because, uh, look, in my work in the last 30 years, um, my focus is the patient doesn't need the medicine. Don't give it to them. When you finish pharmacy school, you understand that uh, there are plenty of reasons you shouldn't just give medications. You need to balance the risks versus benefits. And, and clearly, if there is no need, you're not going to give the medication. So, yeah, first and foremost, pharmacists try to remove medications when they're not necessary. And in many cases, probably no surprise to you, you have medications treating side effects of other medications that the patient is taking. So the better route is to try to change that medication that's causing the side effects in the first place, right? So, so I absolutely agree with, with your take on it. So Steve, during the COVID-19 pandemic, pharmacists have really been out there on the front lines. They're essential employees. They're out there making sure that patients get the medications they need during this uh, challenging time. What's it been like for pharmacists? Have you heard any stories from your colleagues and friends? Yeah, it was a pretty a frantic uh, change to their, their work model. You know, immediately as the lockdown started to occur, uh, pharmacies shifted heavily to uh, mail order operation as much as they could, but still left their pharmacies open because clearly not everybody could uh, do mail order and many people needed the medications urgently. So the pharmacy community was able to, um, you know, fairly reasonably uh, close down the front end of their store, set up pickup locations uh, where patients wouldn't have to come inside, create waiting spaces outside, things like that. So that all worked out pretty well. I think the biggest challenge they had was acquiring um, reasonable PPE. 
uh, personal protective equipment. Um, I think for a while, pharmacists just weren't recognized as frontline uh, healthcare providers that would need PPE. And yet, you know, the patients who are sick that are interfacing with the healthcare system are coming to the pharmacies to get their medications. Uh, so clearly they, they did need them, but that's been resolved at this point. So I'd say for the most part, the pharmacies have adjusted you know, quite well. We all appreciate what you're, what you're doing, being there in many, some cases, even 24 seven to, to help people get their medications at all hours of the night. So one thing about pharmacists, I, I feel that, that sometimes the public doesn't understand the, the scope of what they can and should do. You know, whenever I or a family member gets a new medication, I always take advantage of that opportunity to have a consultation with the pharmacist. Maybe there's something I'm not aware of, how to take it. With asthma medications, for example, they're certainly you're much better off talking to the pharmacist about how to use those inhalers properly than, than us doctors. Um, how, what, what advice would you give to, uh, to the lay public about uh, how to take best advantage of a pharmacist? Yeah, what a great example that is. Uh, I, these devices are used to administer some medications, you know, asthma devices, as you cited as an example, are not only complicated, they're all different. They're all slightly different. And so just because you've used one device doesn't mean you can use another very easily. So, you know, to your point, I would recommend that uh, the public does not decline the counseling because they can, right? The, the public can deny the counseling, just go home with the device and read it up on their own. Um, there are lots of uh, little intricacies that need to be understood with these devices and taking the time to have a pharmacist explain it, who's trained on how to use the device, who's trained hundreds if not more patients on how to use that device is really worth the effort. It's been well shown, you know, Mike, as well, that um, even when you show a patient how to properly use a device, you know, give them a few months to come back and they typically miss many key steps, uh, even if they've mastered it the first time. So what a pharmacist can do for you is keep reinforcing and making sure you're using it well to get the most from that medication. Really important. So Steve, vaccinations is another thing that I'm not sure everyone is aware what pharmacists can do. Yep. Many patients can get their flu shot, their pneumonia shot, shingles vaccine, and a number of others uh, right in the pharmacy through an agreement with a doctor's office or with a, a health plan with it, without even coming in. So a lot of times I'll tell my patients, just get the flu shot at your local pharmacy. Of course, this year with the COVID vaccine, God willing on the horizon, do you envision that, that pharmacists, pharmacists, Pharmacies could be distribution sites for the for the COVID vaccine. Yeah, absolutely. So it was a bit unclear uh, a little while ago, but uh, to your point, I'm not sure if you you knew this, but um, you know, one in every three flu vaccines are administered by a pharmacy. So so you're right; it is uh, widely available. In fact, in every state now, uh, flu vaccine can be administered. In the case of COVID, we had to get some you know special federal permissions to authorize pharmacists to be able to administer it, and, and now we have that. So in short, the answer to your question is, yes, pharmacies are going to be able to administer the COVID vaccine. They're gearing up very quickly for it right now. Uh, and it's critically important, right? If you think about the numbers of, vac of, of, of shots that need to be administered, just about, I think, every one of the uh, vaccines that are being developed are two-shot regimens. Um, if we assume that even half of the U.S. population takes a vaccine, that's you know, 330 million shots, right? So um, no question that we're going to need to deploy pharmacists and everybody all hands on deck to make sure that uh, adequate uh, immunizations can be administered. So Steve, before I started working with you, my vision of a pharmacist was the typical uh, standard retail pharmacist working in a CVS or Walgreens. And this is really important work to safely make sure medications get dispensed correctly. But uh, pharmacists in other settings like Kaiser and the VA and certainly the work that you've done uh, can actually do some additional things too. They can really be what I think of as, as chronic disease managers and under, again, an agreement with a doctor or a medical group, they can um, furnish medications, they can initiate medications for chronic diseases, adjust, discontinue in a very collaborative relationship with uh, a clinician, a doctor. T tell me about what that looks like, how that would feel for a patient and how it's worked at the Kaiser, at Kaiser's and the VA's. Yeah, that, that's a great question. You know, the profession of clinical pharmacy on the outpatient side really was born out of the VA and out of Kaiser. And for reasons that I think are pretty obvious, these are health systems where uh, they're, they're closed, they're contained. So all the not only is all the information in, in a one-stop shop, but any cost savings or benefits to the patient population are, are benefited within the, the entity, whether it's Kaiser or VA. 
so they, they both of those entities widely utilize pharmacists in the outpatient setting to manage chronic disease, providing uh, something we call comprehensive medication management. And that, that basically means whatever the reason the patient is coming to see you, whether it's uncontrolled high blood pressure, uncontrolled diabetes, um, the pharmacist, yes, is focusing on the medication therapies for those conditions and all the patient self-management for those conditions, but they're also looking at all the other medications, all the other conditions, to ensure that the medication regimen as a whole is as safe and effective as possible. So under the old model, if I had a patient with diabetes, they'd come in, we'd start a medication, have them go home, come back a few weeks later, we'd adjust it and keep doing that over and over again for a few months. But usually the patient might, might lose interest by then. Uh, they not, might not be able to come back. So the way it worked with Steve's team is they would come in with that diabetes initially. Rather than me doing all that medication titration, I would walk them over to the clinical pharmacist who would do all that for me, would do a lot of the follow-up by telephone, that would manage the labs, and the patient would come back to me three months later with their diabetes under excellent control. That would free me up to focus on the shoulder pain and the depression, and patients really loved it too. So we found actually that, that patients' chronic diseases like diabetes or hypertension was about 10% better controlled than that would happen uh, with a doctor. And I think very quickly patients really appreciated and, and got it. But it's not the typical uh, vision of a pharmacist that, that many of us uh, have. And this is referred to as advanced practice clinical pharmacy because really what you're doing is you're extending the role of, of the primary care system by, by being there and as a chronic disease manager. And we have, of course, a shortage of primary care doctors nationwide right now. Um, do you see clinical pharmacists as being part of the answer to that to primary care shortage? Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you just summarized is the reason why it works, right? What we do is we, uh, by taking uh, these patients and managing their complex medications and chronic diseases, um, it's able to free up physicians to have more access and time for their patients, uh, which is really where the crux of the problem is, right? I, I speak to physician audiences often, and I, I always make the statement, I don't know how you accomplish all you do in less than 10 minutes. Well, I've known Steve for, for a while now, and he's a very humble guy, and uh, you know he's had a big role in uh, expanding that scope of practice for pharmacists. Now the state of California, I certainly know because I'm here in California, um, uh, considers pharmacists to be a provider. So that theoretically means that a pharmacist could bill for what they do. And uh, you know I think with the aging population that we have and the shortage of people going into the field of primary care, I think a really key part of the answer is to take advantage of the other resources we have. So I've, I've been a big advocate of that a scope of practice expansion and the work that, uh, that Steve is doing. And I actually think that the, the latest iteration of that work that I'd love you to talk about next is bringing those, that, that comprehensive medication management and that chronic disease management into community pharmacies. You know, how many times per month does someone go into a pharmacy, you know, several times, whereas they might only come into to a doctor's office twice a year. So there's just so many more touches. Right. So, so tell us how that might look when you bring comprehensive medication management by a clinical pharmacist into a community pharmacy. Yeah, what a yeah, great, great question. And um, I think you already hit on one of the key points. It's been shown that in the Medicaid age uh, population, uh, they do indeed show up in the pharmacy three times a, a month, right? So almost three dozen times a year. That's a lot of face time and opportunity to check in with patients and, and, and work with them. Uh, and just uh, so you know, and there was a study published about two months ago showing that among Medicare recipients, they, they're in the pharmacy at least once a month. Uh, so again, there's there's plenty of opportunity for pharmacists to get involved. That's uh, really the hook as to why we started to pursue uh, trying to engage community pharmacists in comprehensive medication management. There are 67,000 pharmacies in the United States. Uh, just as, as a comparison, there's 15,000 Starbucks. So there's, there's more than four times as many pharmacies huh, as Starbucks. I never would have guessed uh, that. Yeah, yeah, I don't think anybody does. <laughs> and 90% uh, of the U.S. population lives within five miles of a pharmacy. And in urban areas, it's down to less than two miles. So the access is remarkably good. And it's just a shame to have these um, highly trained and underutilized healthcare professionals in the community not really connected much to the healthcare system when at the end of the day, rubber meets the road is when the patient is getting their prescriptions and the trouble that they're having with them is detected in, in those, those pharmacies. After you and I worked on, with Ultimate on the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Program, we had enough data to start going to health plans and saying, is this something that would be of interest to you? 
could we do this with community pharmacies? And, and do you think it, it, it's something that, that answers a population health need? And they said, yes. So we have a couple of health plans, LA Care and Inland Empire Health Plan, who signed on to what's called the California Right Meds Collaborative, where we have collaborative practice agreements in place. Um, either we uh, suggest and recommend to physicians or you know, where we have really close communication, the pharmacists are able to uh, modify medication therapies and then monitor those patients moving forward. Um, so we're really excited about it. It's uh, It's been moving uh, this last year. I mean, I think this is a great model. I mean, what, what it would mean is that my patients for a chronic disease like d- diabetes or hypertension, they could actually go to their local pharmacy and and get management. And, you know, someone else who's in communication with me could sort of be my eyes and ears and hands uh, you know, you know, in, in the community. And then again, when they come back, then I can have a higher level visit with the patient. I can focus on the, you know, all the other challenges and the things that we don't typically um, get to. But Steve, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention that there is some controversy here, right? Um, you know, it, it has been the medical profession, the organized medicine, you know, even at times, uh, you know, the American Medical Association and, and related groups that, that have been hesitant and anxious. Tell us a little bit about some of the, the concerns and, and resistance you faced. From the uh, physician side, the concerns that most commonly come up are uh, something we already addressed. You know, our pharmacists trained and able to do this. And I think we already covered that uh, the training of pharmacists is quite extensive and is interprofessional at this point. So there's definitely something they can do. Um, but then the, the real things that come out are um, concerns about finances, about billing. Uh, there con- there's concern that somebody else is now entering our fee-for-service domain and potentially taking away my income. That's one. And the other is uh, granting scope for practice, right? Giving pharmacists uh, more scope of things that physicians might think that only they should be doing. So that latter one, I think, is easy to resolve because already the laws in California and many states in the nation offer a fairly broad scope of practice for pharmacists. But it's important to remember, as you said, that these are granted within a collaborative practice agreement. That means the physicians that the pharmacist is collaborating with needs to grant that scope of practice and can restrict to whatever they feel comfortable with. So if a medical group says, we, we like this, but you know, we'd rather you consult with us before you make changes, well, you can build that into the CPA. So I, I always reassure physicians that they are in charge when it comes to how this collaboration works with pharmacists. That's number one. On the payment side, you know, as I think all of us know, we are moving very steadily towards uh, value-based care, uh, care that pays for outcomes as opposed to fee-for-service. And with that in mind, when you look at how the health plans incentivize their physicians, they have report cards that tie heavily into optimal medication use and management and monitoring of patients with chronic diseases. So if we had a pharmacist to team up with physicians, focusing on those patients and focusing on those pay-for-performance measures the end of the day, the, the, the patients get better. Everyone's incentivized to help the patient. And as a sort of benefit, the physicians get paid more because their pay for performance scores improve. Uh, so I, I think when it's framed that way, um, physicians become much, much less resistant. And, and like that, there's something that um, aligns the incentives to benefit the patients and the physicians. So what policy changes would be needed to, um, to, to, to take better advantage of pharmacists? Well, the simple one is, uh, you know, we missed the boat on the Social Security Act and we're never recognized as healthcare providers federally. Uh, so the simple one would be for pharmacists to be recognized as healthcare providers. You know, I've been out of school now for 30 years and I've been hearing almost every year that any day now that's going to happen. So I've stopped holding my breath on that one. <laughs> I mean, certainly it would be wonderful and it would open up the opportunity for pharmacists to bill uh, Medi-Cal, Medicare uh, for these sorts of services. But for now, there's enough value that pharmacists bring that when we align needs of patients with incentives, um, I think there's plenty of opportunity. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to work within the system that we have to um, leverage pharmacists and uh, benefit everyone in the system. The the last question I have for you is, do you just have any advice or guidance uh, to the general public, who's who's our primary audience here, uh, you know, about how, uh, you know, what they should think about when they go into pharmacists and uh, how they can best take advantage of of what you all can do? Yes, I I think most importantly, um, medicines are amazing today. We have drugs that can control and treat so many conditions. 
but none of them are without side effects. And uh, there are interactions that can occur. Uh, don't hesitate when you get a new medication to ask your pharmacist about how to take it appropriately, how to store it, and whether it's safe to take with all of your other medications. And I don't just mean prescribed medications. I mean anything you take on a regular basis, whether it's over the counter, bought from another country, a supplement, um, you would, might be surprised at how many um, pretty serious interactions can occur uh, when you have this mix of all sorts of things that you take for therapeutic purposes. So don't hesitate to ask your pharmacist for advice and guidance. I would second that. And I tell my patients, you know, we, we only have eight to 10 minutes together and I don't have the time to, to, to go through every supplement that you're on and every potential interaction and go make sure you're using everything correctly. Take advantage of the pharmacist when they have that consultation option at the window. It's an extra 10 minutes and it's worth its weight in gold. Well, Steve, I so appreciate you joining me today for the Healthy Skeptic MD podcast. If you like what you hear, please do search for us wherever you listen to podcasts or look in my uh, look for me on my YouTube channel. Again, just search Healthy Skeptic MD. And that's it for this week. Thanks again for joining, Steve.